Welcome to the Legends of Oz. Click on your favorite character to begin your adventure. Hi, my name's Dorothy, and I live in the midst of the great Kansas prairies with my Uncle Henry and Auntie M. Uncle Henry works hard from morning till night, and Auntie M rarely speaks to me. Both of them are stern and solemn, and they never laugh. Where we live, there's nothing but a great gray prairie on every side. The sun bakes the plowed lands until it has little cracks running through it, and the house is dull and gray as everything else. Toto is my best friend. He's a little dog with long, silky hair and small black eyes and a funny wee nose. We play all day and dream about far away places. was even grayer than usual, we heard a strange wailing sound, and when I looked up I saw a terrible cyclone coming towards the house. Everybody ran to the cellar, but before I could make it a great shriek came from the wind, and the house shook so hard that I fell to the floor. The house began whirling around and rose slowly through the air, higher and higher, until it was at the very top of the cyclone. It was dark, and the wind howled horribly. But after the first few whirls, I got used to it. Toto didn't like it at all. He ran about the room, <laughs> and once he nearly fell out the trap door. But just in time, I reached out and caught him by his ear. Hour after hour passed away. At first I had wondered if we would be dashed to pieces when the house fell again. But as time passed and nothing terrible happened, I stopped worrying and resolved to wait calmly and see what the future would bring. Finally... I lay down on my bed and fell asleep. The house landed with a sudden bump in the midst of a country of marvelous beauty. I looked out the window, and approaching me was the group of the queerest little people I had ever seen. They were oddly dressed, with round pointy hats that had little bells around the brims that tinkled sweetly as they moved. With them was a beautiful woman in a gown of little stars that glistened in the sun, the good witch of the north. She welcomed me to Munchkin Land and thanked me for killing the wicked witch of the east. I told her there must be some mistake, that I had never killed anything. She pointed to my house, and there sticking out from beneath it were two feet, still clad in pointed silver shoes, the wicked witch of the east. She said that the munchkins were most grateful to me for releasing them from the wicked witch's bondage.
I felt so lonely among all these people that I began to cry. My tears seemed to move the beautiful woman, for she took off her cap and counted to three. At once the cap changed to a slate, on which was written in big white chalk marks, Let Dorothy go to the city of emeralds. The good witch spoke of a great wizard named Oz, who would help me get home to Kansas. All I needed to do was find the city of emeralds. She then gave me the silver shoes from the Wicked Witch of the East. With that, the good witch whirled around on her left heel three times and promptly disappeared. Toto was startled and barked loudly when she vanished. But I had expected her to disappear in just that way, so I was not surprised in the least. When I asked the munchkins the way to Oz, they said to just follow the yellow brick road. Follow the yellow brick road. Follow, 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 follow the yellow brick road. Within a short time, I was walking briskly towards the Emerald City in my shiny new shoes. I was surprised to see how pretty the country was, and every so often one of the munchkins would come out and bow as I went by. So happy they were that I had destroyed the wicked witch. Eventually, I sat down to rest near a big cornfield where a scarecrow was placed high in a pole to keep the crows from the ripe corn. I stared at him for a while, and I was quite surprised when he winked at me. I was even more surprised when he talked, but I think I'll let the scarecrow tell you the rest. Good day, I said to Dorothy as she stared at me from the fence. I must have looked pretty silly to her, stuck up on a pole in the middle of the cornfield. I was there to scare birds away from the ripe corn, but I must admit I did a very poor job of it, considering my head was stuffed with straw instead of brains. I introduced myself, and she helped me down from the pole. Back on solid ground, I told Dorothy about the munchkin farmers who had made me two days before. They carefully painted my face, making my eyes bright blue. Then I watched them stuff my arms and legs with straw. When they placed my head on my body, I was very proud, for I thought I was just as good a man as anyone. As they carried me to the cornfield, I heard one of the farmers say, that I would scare the crows fast enough, and I quite agreed. But after a while, the crows realized that I was just stuffed with straw, and they began to eat all my corn. I felt sad at this, for it showed that I was not a good scarecrow after all. But one old crow comforted me, saying, If you only had brains in your head, you would be as good a man as any, and a better man than some. Brains are the only things worth having in this world. After the crows left, I decided that I would try hard to get some brains. I could while away the Alberts, confirmed with the flowers, consulting with the rain. And my head I'd be scratching while my thoughts were busy hatching if I only had a brain. Dorothy told me her plan to ask the great wizard for help in getting home to Kansas. I wanted to join her so that I could ask the great Oz to give me some brains. She said she would be happy to have me along. So we continued on to Oz. Suddenly, we heard a groan nearby. To our surprise, we found a tree that had been partly chopped through, and standing beside it, with an uplifted axe in his hand, was a man made entirely of tin. We discovered that he was rusted solid and could not move. Dorothy quickly oiled his joints until he could move freely. We told him of our trip to the Emerald City, he thought for a moment, and then he asked if he could come along and ask the great wizard for a heart. 
I told him we'd be happy to have him. As we continued through the forest, the tin woodsman told his unfortunate story. Once there was a munchkin girl whom I loved with all my heart. She lived with a lazy old woman who wished the girl to remain with her. The lazy old woman requested the help of the wicked witch of the east, who in turn enchanted my axe. As I was chopping away one day, my axe slipped, and I cut myself. A kind tinsmith was able to restore my body with tin parts. But alas, he was unable to replace my heart. When a man's an empty kettle, he should be on his metal, and yet I'm torn apart. Just because I'm presuming that I could be kinda human if I only had a heart. Now my body shines so brightly in the sun that I am very proud of it. The only danger to me is that my joints will rust as they very well did until you came along. But of all the things that I have lost, the greatest is the loss of my heart. All this time, we had been walking deeper into the thick woods. Now and then, there came a deep growl from wild animals hidden among the trees. Even Toto walked close to Dorothy's side and did not bark in return. Suddenly, a great lion bounded into the road. He struck the tin man with his sharp claws, and with one blow sent me spinning over the edge of the road. But Dorothy, fearing for Toto and not herself, slapped the lion on the nose as hard as she could. Then she told him that he was nothing but a big coward for frightening everyone. The lion shamefully rubbed his nose, and then he began to cry. Ow! <laughs> oh, you're right. I am a coward. <laughs> I've always known that, but I can't help it. I was born that way. <laughs> Life is sad, believe me, Missy, when you're born to be a sissy without the vim and verve. But I could change my habits, never more be scared of rabbits if I only had the nerve. After his sad story, Dorothy said he would be welcome to join us on our journey to Oz to ask the great wizard for some courage. She pointed out that he could help protect us from the other wild beasts in the forest. And the lion did just that when we came upon the Kaleidas. But I think it was the Tin Woodsman who really saved the day. The forest was dark and gloomy, and there were strange noises on all sides of us. Even as a woodsman, I was wondering if we would ever see bright sunlight again. Suddenly we came to a wide gulch in the road. Scarecrow suggested that I chop down a nearby tree to create a bridge across it. Thinking this was a fine idea myself, I set to work with my axe until I felled the tree. We had just started across the bridge when a sharp growl made me look up. To my horror, running towards us were two great beasts with bodies like bears and heads like tigers. Kaleidas! We all rushed across the bridge except the cowardly lion who turned toward the Kaleidas and let out a loud and terrible roar. The Kaleidas stopped short, then realizing that there were two of them and they were both bigger than the lion, they continued forward. The lion turned and ran toward us. The fierce Kaleidas began to cross the tree, too. I started to chop away the end of the tree lying on our side of the gulch as fast as I could. Just before the Kaleidas got to me, the tree fell with a crash, and the ugly, snarling brutes were dashed to pieces on the sharp rocks at the bottom. I felt so scared that if I'd had a heart, it would have been beating wildly. 
The adventure with the Collide has left us more anxious than ever to get out of the forest. We traveled late into the evening until we finally found a cozy place under the trees. And there, we slept until morning. That night, I thought of the Emerald City and of the good wizard Oz, who would give me a heart. As we walked the next morning, we listened to the singing of birds and looked at the lovely flowers. Presently, we found ourselves in the midst of a great meadow. There were great clusters of scarlet poppies, so brilliant that they almost dazzled my eyes. The scent of the flowers became so powerful that Dorothy decided to sit down and rest. Instantly, she and Toto were fast asleep. Now, Scarecrow and I, not being made of flesh, were not troubled by the scent of the flowers. But the lion began to get drowsy. Scarecrow quickly told the lion to run out of the deadly poppy field, for if he were to fall asleep too, he would be too heavy to carry out. And the lion bounded away as fast as he could go. Scarecrow and I made a chair with our hands and carried Dorothy and Toto safely out of the flowers. Just a short distance from the edge of the field, we came upon our friend, the lion, lying fast asleep in the poppies. We could do nothing for him, as he was too heavy to carry. We had to leave him there to sleep on forever. Perhaps he would dream that he found courage at last. I felt so sad as we continued on without the lion that I almost didn't see a little gray field mouse being chased by a great yellow wildcat. Although I had no heart, I felt that it was wrong for the big cat to kill so harmless a creature, so I raised my axe and gave the wildcat a scare. The field mouse, freed from her enemy, squeaked, Thank you! and introduced herself as the queen of all field mice. And then she told me that from hereafter, she would obey my slightest wish. At once, I asked her if she could help save our friend, the cowardly lion. As the queen rounded up all her subjects to help, I went to work making a truck out of tree limbs. From all directions, thousands of mice appeared. Each one carried a piece of string in its mouth, and even though the truck was much bigger than any of them, when they were all harnessed together, they could pull it easily. After a great deal of work, we managed to load the lion onto the truck, and with Scarecrow and I pushing from behind, we rolled him out of the poppy field so he could breathe fresh air. The mice were unharnessed from the truck and scampered through the grass. The queen of the mice was the last to leave, and she told me that if I ever needed her again, I should call, and she would come to my assistance. Then we all sat down and waited for the lion to wake up. I woke up feeling fully refreshed and quite myself again. I heard the story of the field mice and laughed. <laughs> I have always thought myself a very big and terrible lion, yet flowers came near to killing me and small mice saved my life. We continued our journey along the yellow brick road, which was now smooth and well paved. It wasn't long before we saw a beautiful green glow in the sky just before us. The Emerald City. We were all very excited that we had made it.
The road came to an end at a big gate, studded with emeralds that glittered in the sun. Dorothy reached up and pushed the bell, and we heard a silvery twinkle sound. Then the big gate slowly swung open. I was so nervous, my knees began to sh sh shake. Before us stood a little man clothed entirely in green. We asked to see the great Oz, and he looked very perplexed. He said that we should not bother the great wizard, as we might anger him, and then he would destroy us. Oof! But the guardian of the gate took out his key and opened a big box full of spectacles. He said that we must all wear a pair so that the brightness and the glory of the Emerald City would not blind us. He fastened the green glasses on all of us, even on little Toto. When we were finished, the Guardian removed a big golden key from a peg and opened the gate to the Emerald City. Even with my spectacles on, I was dazzled by the wonderful sights. I noticed little children hiding in fear behind their parents when they saw me. Oof! But I think I may have been more frightened than they were. The god led us through the streets to the Palace of Oz, where the great wizard lived. A soldier stood guarding the gate. He left us standing there alone for quite some time before returning with the wizard's reply. The great wizard agreed to see us, but we had to enter his presence alone. Oh. Then a green maiden led us into a beautiful green room with a green marble floor and green velvet curtains. And there we waited. The soldier came to get Dorothy first, as the great wizard had heard of her silver shoes and was very much interested in what she had to say. When Dorothy returned, she told us of the beautiful throne room with a chair that sparkled with gems, and of the wizard who appeared as an enormous head with no arms or legs to support him. She said that the wizard refused to help her get back to Kansas unless she did a favor for him first. The wizard wanted her to kill the Wicked Witch of the West. Kill the witch? <laughs> I did not think I needed courage that badly. When Scarecrow spoke with the great wizard, he appeared as a beautiful woman. But when he asked the wizard if he could have some brains, again, the wizard asked for a favor. Kill the Wicked Witch of the West. Tin Man was greeted by a most terrible beast with five eyes, five arms and legs, and thick woolly hair all over its body. It was fortunate that Tin Man had no heart, for it would have been beating fast in terror, but instead Tin Man was very disappointed, for when he asked the wizard for a heart, the wizard asked that he also kill the Wicked Witch. Then it was my turn to speak to the great and terrible Oz. Oh. As I passed through the door, I saw a ball of fire so fierce and glowing that I could scarcely bear to gaze upon it. The heat was so intense that it singed my whiskers, and I stayed trembling near the door. I told him I was the c cowardly lion, afraid of everything, and I had come to beg him for some courage. The great wizard burned fiercely and told me to bring proof that the wicked witch was dead. Oh, and then he would grant my wish. Oh. I was happy to find my friends waiting for me, and I told them about my terrible interview with the wizard. Dorothy, afraid that she would not see her Aunt Em and Uncle Henry again, began to cry. So we decided that our only choice was to go to the land of the Winkies and seek out the Wicked Witch and destroy her. Oof! 
The soldier led us to the gate of the Emerald City. He told us to keep to the west, where the sun sets, and we could not fail to find her. As we started out, I had the feeling the Wicked Witch was watching us. Strangers in my land. I could see them way off in the distance with my one powerful eye. Dorothy and her friends lying asleep. I blew the silver whistle that hung around my neck, and at once forty great wolves came running to me. I told the leader of the wolves to go to Dorothy and her friends and tear them to pieces with their sharp teeth. But one by one, the tin woodsman raised his axe and killed the forty wolves. Once again, I drew my silver whistle and blew two times. Straight away, a great flock of wild crows came flying to me. I told the King Crow to go at once to the strangers and peck out their eyes and tear them to pieces. Then I watched as one by one the Scarecrow caught and killed each of the forty crows. I was so angry I stamped my feet and gnashed my teeth. I called a dozen of my slaves who were the Winkies and gave them sharp spears to kill the intruders. But when the Winkies got to Dorothy and her friends, the lion gave a great roar and sprang towards them. And the Winkies ran back to my castle as fast as they could. Now, what could I do to drive Dorothy and her friends out of my wicked kingdom? I decided that I would use the golden cap. The golden cap had a circle of diamonds and rubies around it, and it also had a charm. Whoever owned it could call three times upon the winged monkeys, and they would obey any order they were given. I had already used the charmed cap twice, once to enslave the Winkies, and once to drive the Great Oz out of the land of the West. I placed the golden cap on my head and said the magic words. Hepe pepe kake, hello, 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 zizizuzizik. <laughs> the sky darkened, the air rumbled with a great chattering and laughing. The winged monkeys arrived. I told them to go to the strangers and destroy them all, except the lion. I wanted the lion brought to me so that I could harness him like a horse. <laughs> I watched gleefully as the monkeys flew to the intruders. They seized the tin man, carried him high in the air, and dropped him on sharp rocks where he fell battered and dented. They caught the scarecrow pulled the straw out of his clothes and flung it high into the treetops. They wound stout pieces of rope around the lion until he was unable to bite or struggle. But they could not harm Dorothy, for the power of good protected her, since she wore the silver shoes. So gently they picked her up and brought her back to my castle with Toto and the lion. Then the winged monkeys, finally free of my power, quickly flew into the air and out of sight. 
Dorothy, I turned into a slave and made her work hard all day. The lion I locked up as he threatened to bite me every time I went near him. Then I began to make plans to steal the silver shoes from Dorothy, for they held a lot of power. Finally, I decided to trick Dorothy while she was cleaning the kitchen floor. I used magic to trip her, and as she fell, one of the silver shoes came off. I quickly snatched it away and put it on my skinny foot. Dorothy became very angry as she was very proud of the shiny shoes. So she picked up a bucket of water and threw it at me! Ah! See what you have done! I never thought a little girl would be able to end my wicked ways! Oh, I'm melting! I'm Being the great and terrible Oz, I knew the instant the wicked witch was destroyed. Of course, I was a little amazed that Dorothy had been able to accomplish it at all. She quickly released the lion from his cage and told the Winkies that they were free from the wicked witch's spell. The Winkies rejoiced, but Dorothy and the lion were still sad that Scarecrow and Tin Man were not there with them. So Dorothy, the lion, and the Winkies set out in search of their friends. Soon they found the battered and bent Tin Man, and set the best Winkie Tinsmiths to work on him. There was a lot of hammering, pounding, and polishing before Tin Man was himself again. With the help of the Tin Woodman, the Winkies chopped down the trees where Scarecrow was scattered. Again the Winkies set to work. They stuffed Scarecrow with clean straw and straightened his clothing. Finally, Dorothy and her friends were once again ready to set out towards the Emerald City. They were coming to ask me, the Great Oz, to grant them their wishes. The Winkies bade them good cheer and gave Dorothy the golden cap, for she thought it was very pretty covered with jewels. Before long, the group became lost, as there were no roads in the rough land of the West. They felt very discouraged, and wondered if they would ever find the Emerald City. The Queen told Dorothy that the Golden Cap was charmed, and Dorothy could request the help of the winged monkeys. So Dorothy carefully placed the cap on her head and said the magic words, just as the witch had done. The winged monkeys quickly arrived and agreed to carry the group to the Emerald City. In no time at all they arrived, and I agreed to grant them an audience at once. I boomed in my loudest voice, I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? Dorothy explained that she had melted the wicked witch and now she expected me to keep my promises. I said they must wait another day while I thought about it. This angered the lion and he gave out a fierce roar. Poor Toto, jumping away from him in alarm, knocked down the screen that I was hiding behind. The Tin Woodman raised his axe and rushed towards me, demanding to know who I was. I am Oz, the great and, and terrible. I told him again, but by this time I was quite frightened that he would hurt me. They all looked quite surprised to see an ordinary man, for I had been tricking people with my magic. I felt quite ashamed. All this time I had been pretending that I was a great wizard. Really, I was just a common man. A humbug. I explained how I had gotten lost in my hot air balloon and landed in Oz. Since I came from the clouds, the 
People thought I was a great wizard. Scarecrow asked if I could still give him some brains, as I had promised. I told him that knowledge is gained by experience, and he already had experience. But if he wanted brains, I would give him some. I removed the straw from his head and replaced it with bran, telling him, Hereafter you will be a great man, for I have given you a lot of brand new brains. Scarecrow was very pleased at having his greatest wish fulfilled, and said that he felt very wise indeed. Next, the tin woodman reminded me that I had promised him a heart. Of course, I thought he was lucky not to have a heart, as they made most people very unhappy. But Tin Man felt he would rather have a heart and bear all of the unhappiness. So I cut a hole in the left side of his tin chest and placed a small red silk heart inside. Now you have a heart that any man would be proud of, I told him. Tin Man said he was very grateful and he would never forget my kindness. The cowardly lion stepped forward and asked for the courage I had promised him. I told him that every living creature on earth is frightened when it faces danger, and all he needed was confidence. The lion said he would like the sort of courage that makes one forget that he is afraid. So I took a little green bottle and poured the contents in a dish for the lion to drink. Courage is always inside one, so drink this and you will be full of courage. The lion quickly drank till the dish was empty. Now it was Dorothy's turn. I thought and thought about what to do, and finally decided that there was no choice but to take her back to Kansas myself. I would take her back in my hot air balloon. I appointed the wise scarecrow to rule over all of Oz in my absence. Then I got into the balloon. Dorothy was still searching for Toto, when suddenly there was a loud crack and the ropes broke away from the balloon. I, I rose high into the air without Dorothy and Toto. I heard Dorothy calling to me as I floated over the plains of Oz. Sadly, I could do nothing. I watched until the Emerald City was just a green speck in the distance. Dorothy was upset at being left behind. She wept bitterly. This made the soldier from the gate feel badly, and he timidly approached her with the suggestion that she journey to the land of the quadlings to seek me, Glinda, the good witch of the south. He told her of the dangers along the way, such as the wild beasts in the woods and the country of men that did not like strangers. But he also explained that the road led straight south, and that she would not get lost. The lion, tin man, and scarecrow all decided to accompany her to my castle, and they quickly set out on their journey. They were happy to be on their way again although they turned to take one last look at the Emerald City. They traveled through the green fields and bright flowers and eventually came to a great forest. As Scarecrow started to pass under the great branches of the first tree, they bent down and twined around him, and then they flung him headlong to the ground. Feeling a little dazed and quite surprised, the scarecrow got up and started forward again. Once again the tree grabbed him and threw him to the ground. Tin Man stepped forward to walk past the tree, but the big tree branch reached down to grab him also. Tin Man chopped fiercely until he cut the branch in two. At once, the tree began to shake as if in pain and stepped back to let everyone pass. After that, the travelers walked with ease through the forest 
until they came to a big white wall that appeared to be made of china. When they climbed to the top of the wall, they were quite surprised to see a great stretch of country before them. The floor was smooth, shining, and white with brightly colored houses everywhere. But the strangest of all were the little people made of china. Dorothy, thinking they were very beautiful, asked the little princess if she could take her home to Kansas. But the princess explained that taking her away from the china country would stiffen her joints, and she would not be able to move at all. So the group made their way, very carefully, to the other side of the china country, for they were afraid of breaking the brittle little people. On the other side they discovered another wild forest. They could hear the growling of many animals around them. A great tiger came up to the lion and requested his help in defeating a monster in the forest. The lion agreed to fight the beast and returned victorious. The forest animals bowed down to the lion as their king and made him promise to return to them. I watched as the travelers got closer to my castle, yet I knew they still had to face the flatheads. When they reached the top of a hill, a strange man stepped from behind a rock. He was short and stout, and he had no arms. Scarecrow started to walk past him, and as quick as lightning, the man's neck stretched out, his head shot forward, and he struck the scarecrow. Then just as quickly, he struck the lion. Dorothy placed the golden cap on her head and called to the winged monkeys. They were as prompt as ever and brought the four travelers to my castle. I listened to Dorothy tell all of her story, how the cyclone had brought her to the land of Oz, how she had found her companions, and of the wonderful adventures they had met with. She told me of her wish to go home to Kansas. I kissed her sweet face and assured her that I would help, but first she must give me the golden cap. I told her that by means of the golden cap I shall command the winged monkeys to carry Scarecrow to the Emerald City where he will be a wonderful ruler. My second command would be to carry the Tin Man to the land of the Winkies, where they eagerly wait for his return. And my third command would be to take the Lion back to the forest, where he shall be king of all the beasts. And then I shall give the golden cap to the King of Monkeys, so they will be free for evermore. Then I turned to Dorothy. You can use the silver shoes to carry you home. You have always been able to use their powers. All you need to do is tap your heels together three times, and the shoes will carry you wherever you wish to go. Dorothy took Toto in her arms and asked to go home to Aunt Em. The air whirled softly around her, and suddenly she was sitting on the broad Kansas prairie. Running towards the house, Dorothy realized she was in her stocking feet, as the silver shoes had fallen and were lost forever. Aunt Em folded Dorothy in her arms, and Dorothy knew she was home at last.
in Kansas anymore. We must be over the rainbow. We thank you very sweetly for doing it so neatly. You filled us so completely that we thank you very sweetly. Let the joyous news be spread, the wicked old witch at last is dead. And as for you, my fine lady, it's true, I can't attend you here and now as I'd like. But just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog, too. <laughs> That's the trouble. I can't make up my mind. I haven't got a brain. Only straw. Well, you're perfect my, now. My neck. My, my neck. Perfect? Oh, bang on my chest if you think I'm perfect. Go ahead, bang on it. Beautiful. What a nickel. It's empty. The tinsmith forgot to give me a heart. No heart? No heart. You didn't have to go and hit me, did you? Is my nose bleeding? Well, of course not. My goodness, what a fuss you're making. Well, naturally, when you go around picking on things weaker than you are, why, you're nothing but a great big coward. You're right, I am a coward. I haven't any courage at all. I even scare myself. <laughs> There's Emerald City. Oh, we're almost there at last, at last. It's beautiful, isn't it? Just like I knew it would be. He really must be a wonderful wizard to live in a city like that. Well, come on, Em. What are we waiting for? Nothing. Let's hurry. Yes, let's run. <laughs> If you please, sir, we want to see the wizard right away, all four of us. Orders are! Nobody can see the great Oz, not nobody, not know how! Oh, but, but please, it's very important. And I got a permanent just for the occasion. I am Oz, the great and powerful. Who are you? Who are you? If you 
please. I am Dorothy. The small and meek. Close your eyes and tap your heels together three times. And think to yourself, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. There's, there's no, no place like home. There's no place like home.